Hello, welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts. I'm here with my guest today. Kelly Steiner from Mananoff Voices for Prevention. And Alicia Walmsley, intern from Mananoff Voices for Prevention. And we're going to talk about, since we're into this, in the hockey finals, the NBA getting pretty close to the end, and um, the Red Sox, they were, were going up, but they went back down again. So it will just be a nice lead in right to athletics. And we're here today to talk a little bit about what the Monadnock region's uh, going to be involved in in the next few months, which is a program called Life of an Athlete. And I'm going to let Alicia, who's really been spearheading this um, as a student from Keene State College, interning with us this initiative. So I'll let Alicia talk a little bit more about it. Okay. Um, Life of an Athlete is developed by the Men uh, American Athletic Institute. Um, and it's a sports consulting firm where um, they're committed to helping people um, both in and out of sports uh, develop strategies to, oh, yeah. Before, before, when you talk Sorry. in and out of sports, when you're talking out, are you talking about possibly overbearing parents? <laughs> yeah, and like fans. We talk about like fan um, code of conduct yep. and uh, like one one of our pieces in the training is with ha that helps um, control parents in the while they're supporting <laughs> their kids. So yeah. That's uh, a nice way of putting that, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> Which means no beating up the goalie because he blocked your son's shot or swearing weird right. words and really rude, crude words that the opposing kids. Mm -hmm. You can support your, your child or the person that you're watching without ruining it for everyone else. So that's what we're supporting. One of the things that we're supporting. The other things that we're supporting is um, alcohol and drug abuse prevention. Um, the three R's, which is rest, refueling, and uh, recovery. Um, we also are talking about hazing and accountability with the coaches and the athletes and having a code of conduct that um, puts everyone accountable for each other and themselves. Um, also a good sportsmanship. When you talk about um, <coughs> code of conduct for the um, coaches, mm -hmm. unfortunately, at probably about seven or eight years ago, we had an event at the Keene State College with someone who happened to be one of our high school coaches who had sent a, some inappropriate alcohol, inappropriate adult magazines, and part of the excuse was it wasn't on school time, so I'm not responsible. So that's some of the stuff you're, you're trying to bring up. Well, what's a little bit <coughs> different about Life of an Athlete is that uh, the program is really designed for um, athletes, coaches, and um, parents to be looking at their behavior year-round, whether the uh, student is involved in that activity at the present time or not. So the code of conduct uh, that's being developed and the policies being developed would apply whether you're um, you know, in season or out of season. So let's, and the other thing is that uh, it it will hopefully have a in the presence of um, part to this code of conduct. So if Alicia and I um, are invited somewhere and we happen to show up and find that there's things going on that we know we're not supposed to be involved in because of the code of conduct, it becomes our responsibility as team members to round up our team members and remove ourselves um, from that environment. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's something that will take place here. This is a program that's um, happening in statewide in other states, New Mexico, uh, Wisconsin, Oklahoma. Oklahoma uh, and high schools in other groups have just adapted it um, statewide and have these codes of conduct. And one of the good pieces of that is that uh, the teams that play each other, then they're all working under the same kind of rules. Uh, and they're used to that. And our goal in New Hampshire is to hopefully have this go statewide. We currently do have high schools in all divisions participating in this. So this training on June 26 is open to rec directors, physicians, uh, athletic trainers, coaches. It's a free training. 
Uh, they are coming in from the American Athletic Institute, John Underwood, uh, the founder of that organization. Um, you know, they work, you mentioned some of the professional <laughs> teams, and uh, they work with those teams, but they believe firmly that if we don't work with the athletes when they're in their high school years, um, that one percent that goes on to become those professional athletes aren't going to have the behaviors and be the role models that we want them to be. And we see that now. So, you know, this organization's a firm believer that we've got to reach young people uh, if we're really going to make a difference in sports. You were talking about hazing, mm -hmm. and we've had some really nasty incidents about hazing. The young man that lost his life down in Florida, mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think people understand, sometimes when you get into the hazing, all of a sudden it turns into a, a lot of the fly type. Everybody just goes into that mass and says, it's not my responsibility, I was just doing what everyone else was doing. And then all of a sudden something tragic happens. What I really like about this program is it changes the set of norms that people have created in the past and makes it a more positive set of norms that everyone can agree on. Um, so if we start young, not only in high school, but both middle school as well that we're um, contributing to this, um, and breaks mm -hmm. that, that cycle. When you were talking about um, starting young, and you started off at high school, now you've got down into middle school, two parts. We got Pop Warner football and other ones, and we've got Cal Ripken baseball. Are those cultures in, allowed to come if they have the opportunity? Absolutely, and it is free. <coughs> uh, it's also, I know um, some of your viewing audience may be people that are moving through. Uh, this is going to be open to all of the bordering communities uh, for New Hampshire. So Maine, Vermont, Mass, uh, coaches, athletic directors are invited to attend this training. And uh, so yes, we would encourage them to actually be there. I, you know, you don't get an opportunity like this very often where we get this level of a trainer coming in and it's free um, and we're actually providing their breakfast in the mm. morning session here in Keene. Mm. The afternoon session or the late even or the um, later afternoon session will be over in Manchester and dinner will be provided during that. Yeah, because at the high school and at the college, there's always someone looking around so you can say, you stepped over the line and, and terminate that coach right now. Babe Ruth and, and Cal Ripken, you've got a lot of great people that volunteer, do a great job, but they're there are still a few people out there that are way, way far too competitive, even down at the t-ball level. And <clears throat> sometimes if they go and say, well, he's the only coach we can get, we can't get enough volunteers. So that's why I was looking at this. This would be an important thing of saying, yes, you're volunteering, but you know what? We could always use a little help to make you better. Yeah, also um, <coughs> it talks about like, this program talks about nutrition and hydration and you look in the convenience stores there's energy drinks and all of these things <coughs> and um, it talk, it trains the parents and the, the coaches as well as the athletes of what the better choices are um, to reach your top competitive strength. So skipping so. a healthy meal and just taking a five-hour energy is not good? Right. <laughs> <laughs> or app and <clears throat> because now, especially for race car, some of the race car drivers, mm -hmm. you know as well as I know, if you're driving 200 miles an hour, you're not plugging, uh, chugging down app drinks because you know you can't afford to be a split second off or you mm -hmm. get killed. Well, that's one of the interesting things <coughs> that we've been learning as we're participating in this program. And um, the educational end of it is amazing. Mm -hmm. They uh, came in and, for example, talking about energy drinks or marijuana. And we were stunned by some of the research they've done on Olympians and other people uh, and high school athletes. And they were able to show, for example, with the marijuana, um, how it affected the brain. Uh, while and for days after you use the substance. So it affects your performance as an athlete. It affects your visual acuity and your balance center. That's the area it actually targets in the brain um, with marijuana. Th with alcohol, it takes four days. Um, if you've had one drink, it takes four days to recoup your level of performance uh, as an athlete. 
And you know, we you've had uh, some of our swamp bat players <laughs> on in the past, and you know they've talked about how competitive it is uh, to go into professional sports, and even at the college level, Cal Division One, Division Two, exactly. Um, <clears throat> and that you need that edge um, of performance because you go from being in high school and maybe being a star in high school to being a star among stars. And I can remember Taylor Williams last year <laughs> saying that, you know, that I'm a star among stars. And if I want that competitive edge, I have to get the right sleep. I have to eat right. Um, you know, I have to maintain a substance-free life. Um, and look at, look at Taylor. He's um, getting ready to move on to the, the next levels. And, um, you know, that's going to make a difference in an athlete's life. And I, and I think you hit the star of a star. There, there was a book, and I, I think you brought up or someone else I was talking about, was when they, they looked at all these athletes. Athletes that are born between January and June perform so much better because in a lot of cases they're a year older. And as parents and coaches, you don't understand that. So all of a sudden you take a couple of these guys, oh, Johnny or Susie's a star, kept pushing them and pushing them and pushing them. And Johnny says, hey, I can go out and get a drink because I'm always so much better. Or Susie can say, hey, you know what? I can go out to McDonald's and, and chill out. Then all of a sudden you get to the level, you haven't learned any of this stuff. You're going against people who know it all and it's really too late for you. You've lost all your potential. Mm -hmm. that, that's very true. And I think um, you know a couple of pieces that you mentioned in there is that um, as young athletes, lots of times people feel pressured to perform and um, pressured by parents uh, even. And, uh, you know, it is about 1% of our population that actually ends up making it as a professional athlete. So more than anything, um, this organization, the American Athletic Institute, wants to pr produce healthy young people for our future. They know that most of them aren't going to go on to become Olympians, um, even though they work with them. They work with Navy SEAL 6. They work with the Air Force on their training uh, so that you're, you're having high performance levels. But they know most people are going to go out into the world and be our workforce. Um, and we want healthy young people that are going out there. Because a lot of people forget athletics is not about making the pros. Athletics is about character development, mm -hmm. leadership, leadership development. If you go and try to go in the Marine Corps officer program, almost all the people who go to the officer's candidates played athletes, were athletic, they were um, team co captains and stuff because they learned to develop character, they learned what to do when you lose because in life you're going to lose a heck of a lot more than, than you win. They realize, you know what, if I want to be successful, yeah, I can't take the drugs, I, I can't do this. I can't be ego, egotistic. And, and that's part of what this program teaches. Um, and one of the things, part of the reason we're starting with the coaches is because the coaches and um, team physicians and these other folks that work with them really um, provide some of that leadership and that training for the young people. They also, I think, um, lots of times don't realize these, the level of influence that they have. Uh, you know, when kids reach a high school age, and we, I'm a parent, I have a 16-year-old, um, she probably spends more time in school and in her extracurricular activities right now than she does at home. Uh, so it becomes very important that we're modeling and, and teaching our, our kids well in these kinds of extracurricular activities. Um, also, like with the pressures that we've talked about before, um, people, oh, at least students, they're they're able, they're wanting to take the easy way out. Oh, if I take this five hour, hour energy, like you mentioned, I'll be able to study all night. But how am I going to feel in the morning? That's the question they don't ask themselves. You know, how am I going to feel like for my game tomorrow afternoon? Um, also. Um, where was I going with that? Uh, I, when I was in, in school, I felt a lot of pressures of um, body image and uh, nutrition and um, drugs and all of that stuff. But when you feel those pressures from your close like parents and your coaches, um, we want to talk to them first because those are the ones that make that 
you feel the greatest pressures from. So if you talk to them first about setting these norms, um, it breaks the cycle of the, that way of thinking. And when, and, and when you talk about body image, <coughs> if you're a girl, oh, you got, you're a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're a female athlete, mm -hmm. okay? If you're an Olympic shot putter, gold medal shot putter, or a discus thrower, or hammer thrower, you are not going, you're a highly successful individual. You, mm -hmm. You've worked hard, you accomplished a great deal, but then you run the risk of quote unquote feeling really low about yourself because quote, you don't meet that body image. So you may have people quote that meet that body image, but they may not be successful in anything. And there's a world of big disconnect there. Mm -hmm. um, I know. I was dancing since I was seven years old, so I felt that pressure of, um, in order to be, I had a dance teacher tell me at a young age, in order to be successful in this class, you should lose 15 pounds. Um, and that stuck with me. That made me want to stop dancing and things like that. Um, but that happens a lot more. Coaches than and I teachers with the wrong words can steal a lot of dreams. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things I remember the Swamp Bat players talking about last year as well, to um, be able to pursue those dreams, that their parents um, and the people that they did have coaching in their lives made all the difference in the world on whether they wanted to continue to play, whether they had that kind of dedication to commit to the things that you just talked about, leadership, um, you know, being part of a team, having to make good decisions, all of those things. And, and it takes some incentive and motivation, and coaches are a big part of that. The, um, did you <clears throat> understand what you're talking about? My fresh, after my freshman year at Keene State College, Bob Taff, who is the cross-country coach, told me to quit because I wasn't good enough and I was too big to be um, a cross-country runner and because um, I was about 35 to 40 pounds bigger than all the other runners and I said some choice words and said nope he's wrong and all this other kind of stuff well I ended up winning the New England AU Marathon Championship and I ran Boston at 230 at 180 pounds and he goes well I didn't know that could be done well coaches are not supposed to be the limiting factor of what can be done they should be looking helping possibilities how you can do it but while being realistic, if you're five foot two, you're not going to be an NBA center. They need to balance it off. And so that's one of the big objectives that you're trying to get across on this. You know, it's funny you bring that up because I think back even to my high school years and uh, I had a, a very, very good friend and he was determined that he was either going to be a movie star or he was going to be an NBA player. <laughs> And uh, he was told by all the faculty that he was never going to achieve either of those things, that he didn't have uh, the focus, he didn't have the height, or he didn't have lots of um, different things. And he's now a movie director um, and has produced several films and um, starred in a couple of films. So it's kind of funny to think back on that, how much we do limit. Um, people in the things that we say and it can be a simple comment that Some can do that can just do it. and you know part of what this program does is really has you look at that um, as a person who's mentoring and working uh, with these young people to think about not just what you say but what you model for them too um, and then how our fans model uh, one of the things we really like about the program and I think the athletic directors that are engaging in this are very appreciative of is a, a whole strategy they have for um, working with fans and it involves just like in a soccer game you know the yellow card the yeah. red card um, you know and it's going to have young people issuing those I, I certainly wouldn't want to be the parent sitting in the stands that has a whistle blown and I'm handed a yellow card warning that uh, my behavior is not appropriate for that environment. <laughs> so I was watching my, my grandson's baseball games yesterday and I was saying it every single pitch there was 12 at least 12 coaches out there every time it was the coach from each team and every a parent of every single player was telling that kid what to do and the batter how to swing and you could see the confused look and these are seven eight nine year old kids they're in here to play the game 
at the end of the game, whether they win or lose, they're all happy and they're friends and everything. But some of the parents are really upset. And it's like, it's, you had the opportunity to play when you were kids. Let kids be kids and let kids play their games. It's so important. And I was at a regatta yesterday because my daughter's crewing. And um, one of the things I really enjoyed about that um, sport right now is that I don't see that level of competitiveness. It's sort of the teams competing against themselves for their own time. So even though they're out there racing each other, uh, you'll see at the end of a race, uh, you know, all the boats waiting for the last boat to come in and all the kids cheering that last boat coming in. And you'll hear all the parents on the sidelines. And um, it's one of the things I've really respected about it right now. And I've, I've thought many times, you know, I have my, my daughter's involved in a lot of other things. I've thought, wow, why can't we do that in these other environments? Why does it become so nasty in some ways? You know, whether it's basketball or a hockey game, um, you know, the last time I was on the show, we talked about the father who had shot the laser beam yeah. into the <clears throat> hockey player's eyes. And, you know, why do we feel the need to, to perform that kind of behavior? Uh, you know, it makes me question what has happened in our sports environment that it's come to that kind of level. You can be competitive without being destructive. Exactly. When you were talking about some of the coaches, one of the things that I've seen been changing, the co we used to have coaches would go and say, no smoking, no chewing, no nothing. But while you're waiting for the kids to get on the bus, the coach is lighting up a cigar or lighting up a, a cigarette. And you're talking about the kids pick that up. It's not what you say, it's what you do. My grandson is an um, unbelievable Red Sox fan, but he likes number two, which is Derek Jeter. Mm -hmm. And he go, why do you like Derek Cheetah? He never cheats. And it, he's, he's nine years old. He likes Derek Jeter because he never cheats. I would hate for him to find out that if for some reason that Derek Cheetah got caught cheating because it would destroy his, his view. But those things are really important to these kids. They're looking up the adults that play fair. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I actually wanted um, to comment on the whole chew piece because yeah. it becomes one of the really <laughs> interesting things in sports. And, um, you know, I was a coach uh, for a little league team along with a man who smoked and he smoked heavily and he chewed. And uh, he didn't have a problem with doing that in front of the kids. And I used to say to him, you know, it's not good role modeling. And he said, but I'm an adult. I have that choice. And I said, but you're an adult that's chosen to mentor young people and to set an example for those young people. And we had some pretty hefty debates. Um, but the whole chew thing, you know, it's fascinating because it's, as it's become more and more popular within the sport environment, We've also seen a huge increase in, in the usage of it yeah. and the cancer associated with it. It's actually the number one um, uh, tobacco substance used uh, by young people. Um, so we don't see as much cigarette smoking anymore, but we see the, um, the chew and uh, th that rate going up. As a father of three daughters, they're gonna say, Dad, why would anybody uh -huh. want to date a guy who spits or chews? I go, I don't know, and it's like, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. I tried to try it once when I was in the Marine Corps, and all I could do was burn, and I'm just, okay, I've done it, get it out of the way. Yeah. But it's just um, one of those peer pressure things that yeah. people do some really stupid things for peer pressure. Uh, on my side job, I'm a cashier at a convenience store, and I see, like, um, coaches with their athletes come in on the way to a game and they'll come and get a couple tins of chew sure. and then the athletes that are 18 and older they come and they get the yep. the chew as well so um, that's like college level but it's they're watching their coaches at a high school level as well do they're that working now. their way to dentures pretty early yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we really want to encourage people to be at this training on June 26th. Um, and again, it's free, it's open to uh, recreation directors, athletic directors, coaches, team physicians, uh, doctors who work with young people because they have a tremendous influence on them. 
uh, you know, one of the things we're seeing more and more of is, you know, athletes even at a young age are being put, for example, on prescription medication so they can continue to play. Um, and then because they can't feel play, uh, pain or the concussion um, in particular, you know, they continue to play and unfortunately sometimes it has consequences. Uh, so we want people there to really learn more about how, um, you know, all of these things, recovery, um, refueling, you know, nutrition, sleep, substances affect the, the player and uh, how they as mentors can be strong mentors. <coughs> so that's um, 8 o'clock to 1230 at June 26 at um, Keene High School yes. at 43 Arch Street. And afternoon, if they can't make it, they'll be in a um, place to be determined, be in Manchester. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a um, <clears throat> couple of things when you talk about some of these things and putting kids on drugs so they can continue to play, concussions. Concussions is a really serious thing. I've had a, at least seven concussions, and um, you don't want to see me on bad days. I can. One of the reasons I don't always watch my shows is because I can go and I'm not thinking right, or I'm not speaking right because I'm having some of the results, effects of the um, concussion. And I can tell you, on those days, it really, really sucks because you're used to what you can do on your good days and not what you can do on your bad days. And that's what an athlete, if it goes, if an athlete gets a bad head injury, it doesn't re rest and recover, he may come back the next day or she may come back, oh, I'm doing really great. And <clears throat> My last concussion when I, I slipped with an ice storm, it was about seven or eight days later. I was at the hospital and I was at a convention and all of a sudden it, went, it, it just went. And it was, I was lucky I wasn't driving or anything, but that's how late, because I said, well, it's no big deal. I didn't rest and recover. And especially for young developing brains. And that is so important of those. Can you repeat those three R's again? The rest, recovering, and refueling. Refueling. Yeah. Um, and after, like, an injury, how soon is too soon for going back to the, um, to the field? You know, um, I know many people after surgery want to get back on the field and uh, being too soon. You can be too soon and you can damage your, yeah, your body for the rest of your life. Yep. Okay, so we're going to get ready and we're going to switch the guests over. And I want to thank you for, for being here. It wasn't that hot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. We'll, we'll get it, keep going, and we'll, you know, and maybe we'll get back and we'll find out and we'll get to talk to some of the people that went to it and what they think about it. That'd be and great. That, that's really good. And so, so, as we get ready to switch guests, what would you like to talk about? Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the work that Keene State College has been doing with Monadnock Voices for Prevention in regards to research and particularly <coughs> around prescription drug use in the Monadnock region. <coughs> and um, I know we were talking before, but one of the biggest things, I know we're going to talk about the college kids, but it seems that people 55 and older are really getting into that abusive drug um, use prescription. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Chris, because uh, one of the headlines I received today, because I get um, these <coughs> RSS feeds, one of the headlines is that uh, 65 and older now have become uh, the highest rate of misuse as it relates to <coughs> prescription drugs. Not just due to confusion um, and things about their medications, it's actual um, increasing addiction uh, to the substance itself. So yes, it's becoming quite a problem. Um, what was interesting is they showed that the 50 to 65 year old um, population, the um, highest level of misuse for a substance that's illegal is marijuana. Um, but 65 and older is the prescription drugs. The, um, I was doing a radio show Sunday, Saturday and we had the woman from age prevent, HIV and AIDS prevention and it was like, <clears throat> you're talking about being able to grow older and mature and be able to, to mellow out, Not, no pun intended, mm -hmm. but it would seem that <clears throat> that 55 and older, they had the highest rate of HIV, highest rate of sexual transmitted diseases, some of the highest su accidental deaths from drug overdose. I don't think we're setting a very good example for our, our grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> um, 
And we've just been joined by Marge. Um, Marge is the um, professor at Keene State that's been working with Mananoc Voices for Prevention and um, provided an incredible opportunity for us to actually have students go out into the community interviewing. They interviewed um, me. And, they and other folks job. in um, the uh, both senior population, uh, young people, people in schools, people in um, therapeutic environments. So they, nursing homes, they covered a variety of areas. Um, and, you know, we can talk a little bit about some of the findings. Um, Want to share some of the research um, projects themselves because uh, really this is a very exciting project for Keene State and has actually become um, very recognized both within the state of New Hampshire as part of the uh, call to action because prescription drugs have become such an epidemic uh, and been recognized by one of their former alumni who's, who's uh, been very key down in Kentucky uh, related to this. So let Marge yeah. jump in here. Hi Chris. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm an assistant professor with the health science department at Keene State and in fact Alicia who you just had <laughs> on was one of my students um, and the relationship that she now has with Kelly at Monadnock Voices um, is the result of a class that we did together uh, called Health and Society and that's really where this whole research relationship with Kelly began. Uh, because I was really interested um, to follow through on the, um, the mission of Keene State, which as you know, if you've seen that archway, is yep. enter to learn, go forth to serve. And in order for our students to go forth to serve in the community, they need to have the tools and skills to do that. And our mission at Keene State is to start them uh, with undergraduate research opportunities quite early in their college career. So they're not doing it as a senior capstone class, but they're doing it as sophomores and juniors and even freshmen. Uh, so uh, when Kelly came to co-teach with me in a class a couple semesters ago, um, it was with sophomores and in fact Alicia was one of those <coughs> sophomores and now she's an intern with them. So the beauty of these types of relationships is that it can lead not only to skill development but also to job opportunities. Um, and in today's employment situation, internships and job opportunities are few and far between. And the importance of critical thinking, critical and research does that. Absolutely, and it's one of the reasons why I joined you on the school board <laughs> was to um, hammer home the importance of the ability to analyze and think critically and most importantly the ability to write. And if you do undergraduate research, you do all of those things and then some. So when Kelly and I first joined forces, um, all of those skills came into play and I think Kelly can speak to that. Uh, but we joined with her to investigate um, how the community mm -hmm. viewed the problem of prescription drug abuse. And uh, they were adamant that we also look at some particularly vulnerable mm -hmm. population groups, in this case, college age adults um, and also the seniors. So we did that. And I think, Kelly, you can speak to that. The results were quite stunning. Uh, definitely. You know, there, when we look at uh, as a community group serving the community, one of the things we're always looking at is what is the real need. And, uh, you know, sometimes you think you may know the answer to those things. This really allowed us an opportunity uh, to find out the reality of things. And so, for example, with the senior population, you know, we had wondered what's the level of sharing? How, do, how does the economy affect their use of prescription drugs. Um, and one of the things we found is that, you know, it, it's not, there's some economic piece in there, but part of it is that people tend to keep their medications f um, because of the cost of them. Um, but that covered the socioeconomic span. It, it wasn't any one population. It wasn't a low, um, you know, the disadvantaged or anything. It could be anyone who just says, well, my doctor put me on this. Now they changed me, but I'm going to keep this one and I'll take it um, when I run out of the other one. That becomes misuse because your doctor has said that that's not having the effect it, it should have. Um, we also uh, found out some very interesting information about people's access 
um, to both um, getting their medications and disposing <laughs> of their medications. And it's allowed us to try to address those issues in a better way. With the college students, um, we um, did have some um, thoughts that, you know, the use of Ritalin and some of the other uh, Adderall and things um, could be at high levels. Um, you know, the, uh, one of the findings really around the stress that um, young people are um, under and so the mental health issues combined with um, the use of these medications and that we can't uh, address the issue in isolation from that. Um, and I think one of our most stunning findings is probably the use of over-the-counter um, medications and or I should say abuse um, and misuse and how much that's tied to suicide attempts, um, uh, suicidal thoughts and actual successful uh, suicides and uh, the combination just how much people are combining these things whether it's with herbal um, you know, <coughs> medications or um, herbal substance supplements that they may be on, um, combining it with alcohol. Yeah, you're gonna, that was my point, I was gonna bring the synergy problem. Yes. <clears throat> because yeah, you know what, I have one little pain pill and I'll just have a beer, what's, what's the difference? Uh, you know, I was just, um, I'm on the Governor's Prescription Drug um, Task Force, Implementation Task Force, and a, a lot of that's because of the work that we've accomplished here in the Monadnock region with the help of the students. And, uh, but, I was sitting with the head of um, highway safety and they were sharing that that's one of the biggest issues they're dealing with right now is drug driving. And um, that is related to people aren't over the limit on their alcohol consumption, but they're combining it with other things. Um, and they, the, one of the last fatal accidents in uh, New Hampshire involved this, um, where a, a parent had uh, consumed two um, drinks, so when they blew th on the breathalyzer, they weren't over limit. However, they had combined it with painkillers that they were on. Um, so they had an accident um, and then fled the scene because they got nervous um, and left a child and injured partner um, in the vehicle. <coughs> um, so it's, it's definitely becoming more and more of an issue. You know, the research work from the um, students has helped us to identify some specifics that we want to work on. We know disposal remains um, quite an issue in the region. It's stunning the amount of um, prescription medications. Uh, at the last Take Back event, uh, you know, two tons um, uh, in the state of New Hampshire taken in. Uh, we have the regular disposal location here in Keene. We'll be expanding on that. The students have been helpful in identifying for us um, through their community projects that they've been doing, ways that we can better reach the community um, to make them both aware of those disposal locations, um, but also to make them more accessible. I think the students are starting to get like we were talking about athletes. They understand if they're gonna go out in the world, they're gonna be competitive, they can't be dependent on over-the-counter drugs or, or Ritalin or whatever to, to get out there because the, the employer says there is no special need type stuff. We want you at your best. Mm -hmm. There's no excuses. You're absolutely right, Chris. <coughs> and what I loved about this particular research uh, was a quote from one of the students who was involved in assessing our community's readiness to deal with this problem or even to admit that there is a problem. And she said, you know, I came to the community, the campus community of Keene State, and as a student, we all thought, oh, it's cocaine, it's heroin, uh, ecstasy, <coughs> whatever the, you know, the, the drugs that receive all the media mm. attention. She said, I never knew that there was such a problem with prescription drugs. So not only did the students provide some great information from Nadnock Voices, they also were learning themselves and therefore teaching their peers that they interact with both in the classroom and in the cafeteria, in the res halls. So it was a real awakening, a real education for the students themselves. The other thing I love about this type of research project is that it always leads to something else. And I think Kelly and I will be together forever now <laughs> because every time a semester ends, something else comes up. And sure enough, the very next semester, um, my behavior change class was involved in some qualitative research using focus groups with seniors 
And now since then, uh, one of my health science students won um, a big uh, scholarship, a research scholarship to work over the summer assessing um, perception of risk around marijuana use in the Monadnock region. And all of this really has stemmed, I think, from the research relationship that the college has with Monadnock Voices for Prevention. So as a professor, I couldn't be more thankful for the learning opportunities that, um, that this coalition has extended to our college, and, and I just love it. And I feel that that really speaks to our mission. Our students need to serve the community. And so when you're looking at, as, as a parent, I could go and say, well, well, Johnny doesn't smell like marijuana, so it's all right for my daughter to get in the car, or I don't smell booze on his breath. But <clears throat> I was never even thinking about maybe he's got two extra shots of, of Ritalin in him and he's going to panic someplace. And so for us, this is really teaching the parents, you're looking at the wrong area. You're looking at something that was so obvious, but it's no longer obvious, but can be just as deadly. I, I was just going to comment that one of the um, projects <laughs> the students did, um, teams of them actually presented at the Academic Excellence <laughs> Conference at Keene State. And uh, you just brought that up, and two of the parents actually came um, to me after the presentation and said, you know, we never realized. Uh, we never realized what was really going on with this, what we could have been watching for um, with our own children. Because people don't, you don't smell it, you don't see it. Um, it's why we have more drug driving. It's why you see more of it in the workplace now. Um, we also have um, prescribing. We have, you know, a lot of medications, and medications can be good for you when they're used properly. When they're not used properly, um, they can become a danger to you within your work environment, uh, within your academic, um, and to other people. And and Go. Kelly spoke about the Academic Excellence Conference. Um, you know, that's uh, an annual mm. event that we hold at the college mm. to present all of the research that our undergraduate mm. students are doing. And I'd like to add that that gave such a wonderful component to this project and this relationship because oftentimes our sophomores and our juniors don't get the chance to stand up before communities mm. and present findings. You know, collecting data um, can be actually easier than presenting it. it. Um, so here they are, not only learning wonderful research skills, but they're also learning how to present findings to a community. And you and I both know in, in a professional mm -hmm. capacity, we have to talk all the time. Look what we're doing right yeah. now. We have to be able to talk sensibly in an educated way and to put our message across succinctly. Well, all of those things these students had to do at the Academic Excellence Conference. Alicia, by the way, presented at that too. And it's just been a wonderful experience for me to see their growth as young professionals as a result of this relationship. So not only were the findings very valuable and will continue to be, but as a teacher and as someone who wants to see my students succeed in a very competitive job environment, these were skills that blossomed, I feel and gave them such confidence and self-esteem. And that can be just as important um, as collecting data and becoming a researcher. And, and I want to add on to that that um, I think one of the other things that happened was um, some of these students were, for example, community health people or nursing students. And I can remember one of the nursing students say to me, I will never look at an individual the way <coughs> I've been taught to look at them again. And she said, you know, having gone out, and she said, I have to know more about that person when they walk through the door. If I'm in the emergency room, I can't just see them as a person in an emergency that needs help. I need to know a little bit more about them to truly be able to help them. You don't get that kind of experience, that kind of learning in the classroom. And, and the students were very clear about that, that this had actually changed how they professionally felt they had to perform in the future, um, their own behavior. Uh, you know, it definitely had some impact on their own behaviors. And what you're hitting on is, it gets my, it gets, I get myself in trouble <clears throat> in, in politics all the time is because to me, there is no statistical person. It's, it's so easy to collect the data and create a statistical person, but that person doesn't exist and we tend to view each one of those individuals as the same statistical person. Mm -hmm. You're right, I think it's so in, important to view that person 
as the individual. If we view that person as the individual, they feel better about themselves, and there is a lot less abuse. People who feel good about themselves don't abuse themselves. Well, absolutely, and, and I'd like to take this even one step further, and that's the advocacy piece that we did with students just last semester to where uh, they went and actually went to Concord and learned about how a bill becomes reality. Um, so, you know, we're empowering mm. our students through this research relationship. So you collect the data, you present the findings. Now, do you want to change something? Is what you found uh, worrying enough to you, of concern enough to you, that you'd like to step up and speak out? And that's the next step that we're working um, with Monadnock Voices on and New Futures, if you want to speak to that a little, Kelly. Uh, and that's actually been put into action, and I'm, I know you're very aware of the prescription monitoring uh, program that I just passed. I listen to you and I change my vote. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> um, that did pass the House yeah. and uh, has passed the Senate. Uh, so our students were actually up in Concord right before mm -hmm. that. and. Uh, took part in calling uh, legislators and it's funny because I sent out the announcement of how the bill had passed and uh, I've had a email from every single one of those students that was in Concord saying yay we did a good job then. <laughs> <coughs> so I think becoming the advocates um, and understanding how they can create policy change really important and now these these students are wanting to actually sit down and look at um, what kinds of things could they introduce? I think they'll be contacting you because they're going to uh, want to look at what is what is happening in relation to this. What kinds of policies do we, maybe we need to have the um, legislature look at, and how can I introduce that? So they're picking, they're beginning to pick topics and things that they'd like to focus on. So you better get ready, Chris. Well, <laughs> that is so critically important. And <clears throat> when I went the first. King State College for my first degree. We didn't do research. We didn't have to do anything. <clears throat> the second time around, yes, I, I got had to do some research, and and it's important. It, <coughs> excuse me. It's really important, and because but too many of the students still think because if I'm a politician at the city council at the state house, I know more. I know the big picture. And so, but there may be something that's important to you, and you're right. If the student goes out and collects the data, analyzes the data, and can present it to me saying why we should make a change, I'm going to sit down and listen. And them getting more involved going up to Concord is saying, yes, you can make a big difference because if you don't want to make a difference, someone else is going to pay to make a difference. Well, absolutely, and we actually have um, a, a wonderful uh, thing that we do at Keene State, which is called the American Democracy Project. And with the ADP, we call it for short, um, it's an organization that encourages our college students to be active citizens in the democratic process. And so what we did with Monadnock Voices absolutely was in line of that. And in fact, I'm going to a conference this week with the ADP team um, from Keene State and we'll be speaking about the relationship that we have with Monadnock Voices and how students are becoming advocates for change. So this type of thing is crucially important to the mission of Keene State um, in addition to going forth to serve. So I really can't think of a, of a better relationship. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and, and I do want to say that one of the, you know, I happened to be with the students the day they went to Concord and it, one of the nice things to see was it engaged them in really wanting to not be just part of change, but a lot of them said, I didn't realize I could have this kind of influence, that I could reach out to Chris Roberts and have a conversation with him about what I think needs to be changed, um, and to be that kind of advocate, and to feel like they had some of that power and that control. And the other thing was that they walked out saying, you know, I need to vote. Because <laughs> one of the things that, that I saw different with some of the students, where in the past was, it was either Democrat or Republican. <laughs> I'm not going to think, I'm going to vote the way they tell me. Mm -hmm. But now, as they're looking the issue, if, if a Republican meets my issue, I'm going to support it. If a Democrat's going to meet the issue, I'm going to support it. It's, it's going to be issue, it's issue based, not party based. And I think that as far as the group, 
that benefits because I think the students are learning this hundred or nothing is not the way to go for the future. And one thing I've observed <coughs> from this research project is people want to hear from college students. They're That's bored right. with us, to be honest yeah. with you. Oh, here's another professional coming in with their <coughs> little drum to beat. Mm -hmm. They love to hear the young adults. That's right. And they're a lot more persuasive. And let me tell you, as a researcher collecting data, college students do it a lot easier than I can <laughs> do it. So I love to see them go out and collect this data. Uh, because people open up to them. Yep. Uh, it doesn't matter what age group, don't you think so, yeah, Kelly? I, I mean, I the agree. seniors open up to them, they love them. Uh, the young, their peers mm -hmm. do, of course, and everyone in between. <coughs> so uh, I really don't see any downside to this type of research relationship, and I, I'm a strong, strong advocate for doing this um, with all levels of college graduates. Because like I said, the, the individuals, there's about four or five that interviewed me, they were well prepared. They made sure they had all the documentation, all the confidential. They had everything right there. It was, <clears throat> and they had a good time. Sometimes well, as they a professor, <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that. <laughs> That's good feedback. <laughs> Thank you. But but they did, and um, they asked me from my point of view where why I was coming from and why I supported certain things, why I didn't support certain things, and because they would say, wait. It's so simple to support this, but yeah, but you don't about the second or tertiary effect of this. Mm -hmm. I can give you what you want right now, but you're not going to want the second, the results farther down the line. It's like, oh, we weren't thinking about that. So mm -hmm. they were engaged. They were really engaged, and you could be proud of them. I am really <coughs> proud of them, and I'm really proud of the college for being so supportive of this type of project. Um, you know, that's evidenced by the fact that this one health science unit was a awarded a $4,000 scholarship to do this type of research over the summer. And that's huge, and that shows you that Keene State really values this type of learning. Well, we've got about two minutes left, so what would you like to wrap up? Well, I just wanted to share that uh, we'll continue to work with the Keene State College students. We actually have a team of 10 students that will be working with us over the course of the next year. So you'll see them out and about in the community because they will be um, doing a series of uh, not just data collection, they're actually mobilizing all the communities in the Mananoc region to hopefully engage them um, in working on the different issues based on what they see as the needs for their very own community. So when they go into a Gilsum, for example, and work with a, p a group from Gilsum, it'll give Gilsum an opportunity to say, this is what's important to us, and this is what we want to work on. So uh, we'll actually have students mobilizing um, small teams of people out across the Monadnock region in the next year. So you can expect to see them and uh, expect to, I think, see uh, more of their research findings. And you actually will also see some of it um, being played out through the statewide plan that's being implemented, some of the strategies that they've selected and uh, recommended. Are some of the findings on your website? Or uh, they all are, and um, there will be a lot more that will be coming out um, as the these students doing on our website, um, monadnockvoices.org, okay. and um, so mm -hmm. they can definitely go there uh, to find those. They can also call us. Or call uh, Keene State at the Health Science Department, or even attend the Academic Excellence Conference, which is free and open to the public every year. And <coughs> what I like about, you, you brought it out because Sunday, Saturday when I was on the radio when we were talking about HIV, the woman told, said, wait a minute, this is a sm small community, so we don't need to talk about it because we have such a small community, we don't have that problem. But as your research and data is saying is, we have that problem, and because you're doing it and your students are doing such a great job, we're now working on solving the problem. Or at least oh, enlightening people enlightening that there people. is a problem. problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's going to be, you know, sort of our first hurdle to get over is that uh, people need to understand that it is an issue, um, becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, one in nine um, high school age youth, for example, in the Monadnock region has now abused uh, prescription drugs. And on that, I will end it. I want to thank you all three of you for being here today. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> and I'm Chris Roberts, and I'll see you out there on the long road. Thanks, Chris.